He was a keen judge of human nature and a very efficient propagandist. His is a personality difficult to visualize, but he was a very earnest disciple and an increasing believer in the mission of Jesus and in the certainty of the kingdom. Jesus never gave Levi a nickname, but his fellow apostles commonly referred to him as the money-getter. Levi's strong point was his wholehearted devotion to the cause. That he, a publican, had been taken in by Jesus and his apostles was the cause for overwhelming gratitude on the part of the former revenue collector. However, it required some little time for the rest of the apostles, especially Simon Zelotes and Judas Iscariot, to become reconciled to the publican's presence in their midst. Matthew's weakness was his short-sighted and materialistic viewpoint of life. But in all these matters he made great progress as the months went by. He, of course, had to be absent from many of the most precious seasons of instruction, as it was his duty to keep the treasury replenished. It was the master's forgiving disposition which Matthew most appreciated. He would never cease to recount that faith only was necessary in the business of finding God. He always liked to speak of the kingdom as this business of finding God. Though Matthew was a man with a past, he gave an excellent account of himself, and as time went on, his associates became proud of the publican's performances. He was one of the apostles who made extensive notes on the sayings of Jesus, and these notes were used as the basis of Isidore's subsequent narrative of the sayings and doings of Jesus, which has become known as the Gospel according to Matthew. The great and useful life of Matthew, the businessman and customs collector of Capernaum, has been the means of leading thousands upon thousands of other businessmen, public officials, and politicians down through the subsequent ages also to hear that engaging voice of the Master saying, Follow me. Matthew really was a shrewd politician, but he was intensely loyal to Jesus and supremely devoted to the task of seeing that the messengers of the coming kingdom were adequately financed. The presence of Matthew among the twelve was the means of keeping the doors of the kingdom wide open to hosts of downhearted and outcast souls who had regarded themselves as long since without the bounds of religious consolation. Outcast and despairing men and women flocked to hear Jesus, and he never turned one away. Matthew received freely tendered offerings from believing disciples and the immediate auditors of the Master's teachings, but he never openly solicited funds from the multitudes. He did all his financial work in a quiet and personal way, and raised most of the money from among the more substantial class of interested believers. He gave practically the whole of his modest fortune to the work of the Master and his apostles, but they never knew of this generosity, save Jesus, who knew all about it. Matthew hesitated openly to contribute to the apostolic funds, for fear that Jesus and his associates might regard his money as being tainted, so he gave much in the names of other believers. During the earlier months, when Matthew knew his presence among them was more or less of a trial, he was strongly tempted to let them know that his funds often supplied them with their daily bread, but he did not yield. When evidence of the disdain of the publican would become manifest, Levi would burn to reveal to them his generosity, but always he managed to keep still. When the funds for the week were short of the estimated requirements, Levi would often draw heavily upon his own personal resources. Also, sometimes when he became greatly interested in Jesus' teaching, he preferred to remain and hear the instruction, even though he knew he must personally make up for his failure to solicit the necessary funds. But Levi did so wish that Jesus might know that much of the money came from his pocket. He little realized that the Master knew all about it. The apostles all died without knowing that Matthew was their benefactor to such an extent that, when he went forth to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom after the beginning of the persecutions, he was practically penniless. When these persecutions caused the believers to forsake Jerusalem, Matthew journeyed north, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and baptizing believers. He was lost to the knowledge of his former apostolic associates, but on he went preaching and baptizing through Syria, Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, and Thrace. And it was in Thrace, at the Symmachia, that certain unbelieving Jews conspired with the Roman soldiers to encompass his death. And this regenerated publican died triumphant in the faith of a salvation he had so surely learned from the teachings of the Master during his recent sojourn on earth. 8. Thomas Didymus Thomas was the eighth apostle, and he was chosen by Philip. 
In later times he has become known as Doubting Thomas, but his fellow apostles hardly looked upon him as a chronic doubter. True, his was a logical, skeptical type of mind, but he had a form of courageous loyalty which forbade those who knew him intimately to regard him as a trifling skeptic. When Thomas joined the apostles, he was twenty-nine years old, was married, and had four children. Formerly he had been a carpenter and stonemason, but latterly he had become a fisherman and resided at Tarakia, situated on the west bank of the Jordan where it flows out of the Sea of Galilee and he was regarded as the leading citizen of this little village. He had little education, but he possessed a keen, reasoning mind, and was the son of excellent parents who lived at Tiberias. Thomas had the one truly analytical mind of the twelve. He was the real scientist of the apostolic group. The early home life of Thomas had been unfortunate. His parents were not altogether happy in their married life, and this was reflected in Thomas's adult experience. He grew up having a very disagreeable and quarrelsome disposition. Even his wife was glad to see him join the apostles. She was relieved by the thought that her pessimistic husband would be away from home most of the time. Thomas also had a streak of suspicion which made it very difficult to get along peaceably with him. Peter was very much upset by Thomas at first, complaining to his brother Andrew that Thomas was mean, ugly, and always suspicious. But the better his associates knew Thomas, the more they liked him. They found he was superbly honest and unflinchingly loyal. He was perfectly sincere and unquestionably truthful. But he was a natural-born fault-finder and had grown up to become a real pessimist. His analytical mind had become cursed with suspicion. He was rapidly losing his faith in his fellow men when he became associated with the Twelve and thus came in contact with the noble character of Jesus. This association with the Master began at once to transform Thomas's whole disposition and to effect great changes in his mental reactions to his fellow men. Thomas's great strength was his superb analytical mind, coupled with his unflinching courage, when he had once made up his mind. His great weakness was his suspicious doubting, which he never fully overcame throughout his whole lifetime in the flesh. In the organization of the Twelve, Thomas was assigned to arrange and manage the itinerary, and he was an able director of the work and movements of the Apostolic Corps. He was a good executive, an excellent businessman, but he was handicapped by his many moods. He was one man one day, and another man the next. He was inclined toward melancholic brooding when he joined the Apostles, but contact with Jesus and the Apostles largely cured him of this morbid introspection. Jesus enjoyed Thomas very much and had many long personal talks with him. His presence among the apostles was a great comfort to all honest doubters and encouraged many troubled minds to come into the kingdom, even if they could not wholly understand everything about the spiritual and philosophic phases of the teachings of Jesus. Thomas's membership in the Twelve was a standing declaration that Jesus loved even honest doubters. The other apostles held Jesus in reverence because of some special and outstanding trait of his replete personality, but Thomas revered the Master because of his superbly balanced character. Increasingly, Thomas admired and honored one who was so lovingly merciful, yet so inflexibly just and fair, so firm but never obstinate, so calm but never indifferent, so helpful and so sympathetic but never meddlesome or dictatorial, so strong but at the same time so gentle, so positive, but never rough nor rude, so tender but never vacillating, so pure and innocent but at the same time so virile, aggressive, and forceful, so truly courageous but never rash or foolhardy, such a lover of nature but so free from all tendency to revere nature, so humorous and so playful but so free from levity and frivolity. It was this matchless symmetry of personality that so charmed Thomas. He probably enjoyed the highest intellectual understanding and personality appreciation of Jesus of any of the Twelve. In the councils of the Twelve, Thomas was always cautious, advocating a policy of safety first. But if his conservatism was voted down or overruled, he was always the first fearlessly to move out in execution of the program decided upon. Again and again would he stand out against some project as being foolhardy and presumptuous, he would debate to the bitter end, but when Andrew would put the proposition to a vote, and after the Twelve would elect to do that which he had so strenuously opposed, Thomas was the first to say, let's go. 
he was a good loser. He did not hold grudges 